I'm going to repeat the questions because we're going around with one mic. It's going to be a problem. So speak up. Go ahead. Without the mic, because it'll take forever to wait for mics. <laughs> That's okay. I I'd like, be pretty shocked if you did. Yeah, I feel like um, selfishness, it breeds other emotions. Like selfishness itself might not be bad in certain cases. So give me but, an example. Um, well, I'm from India, so I can give you the Indian example. <laughs> Gandhi was actually like from a pretty well-off family. If he had been selfish and followed like his course as a lawyer in South Africa, India would still be under oppression by the British. And um, as a product of that, I can only see two outcomes. Either India is oppressed and Indians are oppressed, and the other one is Indians rise up against the British. And then you get violence and that's violence. Yeah, that's okay, so I get, the, I get the point. So Gandhi, uh, a selfish thing for Gandhi to do would have been to continue to be a lawyer and go and make money, right? Be a successful lawyer. But he chose, instead of that, to do something selfless, and to lead the Indian nation to independence in a peaceful way, which resulted in lots of good things. And I, you know, and let's just assume that the setup is true. That is, that everything you said is true. I'm not an expert in Indian history, so I don't. See, part of the problem is that the way we be taught about selfishness is to assume that selfishness equals money. But selfishness doesn't equal money. It equals pursuing the values the rational values that are going to make your life the best life that it can be. Many people choose to get have less money. So I'll give you an example. I, I mean, I'll give you a personal example. I got a PhD in finance. I had job offers from Wall Street, and I and I had job offers from academia. Clearly, Wall Street would have made me a lot more money. I would I would be a millionaire today, many times over. I chose to go into academia. Why? Because I love teaching. I love this stuff, if you can't tell. I love this stuff. You can't buy this stuff. You can't buy what we're doing right now from my perspective. You can give me millions of dollars. This is what I want to do. I don't want the money. And that, to me, is the most selfish thing I can do. It's not about money. It's about what are your values. What are your rational values? Now, let's say Gandhi... I mean, I don't know Gandhi, so this is imaginary, right? Because in Gandhi, money not to be selfish. You know, but if he was, a peaceful resolution to India, a place where he grew up, where his entire family is, where the people he loves lives, where he is going to live, was more important to him than money. Now, I'm not saying it was a selfish decision, because I don't know what went inside his head. But it could be a selfish decision. Don't associate selfishness with money. Just like Steve Jobs doesn't only make this for money. Now, by the way, I get paid for doing this. So I'm not doing it for free. And I wouldn't do it for free. I mean, SFL's not paying me. My institution's paying me a salary. This is my job. I wouldn't do it for free. So I'm still in it for the money. But I'm willing to give up a lot of money to get the pleasure, the fun, of educating minds. Right? Now, some of you think corrupting, but I think educating minds. Um, just like Steve Jobs wanted to make money doing this, but he also wanted to make something beautiful that wasn't about money. Now he wouldn't have made, he needed both. So one of the corrupting influences of this other morality right, is to make you think of selfishness, not just blind stealing and so be, but money. It's funny, the left, I'll just generalize, left Marxism generally, is the most material, money-obsessed group I've ever met. And it's people like me who love capitalism, who love free markets, who love freedom, who care a lot less about money. Money's less important. There's a lot of things more important than money to me. And money's good. A lot of things more important than that. But the left can only think about money. Dialectic materialism, it's called. Not dialectic spiritualism or anything else. Yes. Uh, should I just point? I don't know where the mic is. I have oh, a question. Sorry. And uh, I already have the mic. Yeah. Uh, I have two comments first and, and then afterwards a question. My first comment is that uh, seems that we're already in nature, you know, about 1% of, uh, of people are, are born, you know, as your perfect type, you know, unable to feel compassion for other people, they call psychopaths. But uh, 
it seems it seems like they, they the, the things that they have in their personality corresponds quite a lot with the, with the Pisaki. Another point I'd like to make is that uh, Demar the Rizzo was not a great person, as everyone would say. But uh, yeah, she, she was quite a horrible person who wanted to, if anything, keep the, the people of Bangalore in, in poverty forever. And um, so pointing to her as being, you know, the pinnacle of good people. Uh, no, 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 I don't think she's a good person. I think the culture thinks she's a good person. She's a horrible yeah, person. She was for lots of reasons, among others, what you just said. Sure. I agree completely. My last comment on my question is then, uh, I mean, if we're going to try to create, create a society where we optimize the happiness of people and you see more government taxation as, as the problem with that, I do wonder why the people of Denmark seem to be so much happier than the people of Somalia. Somalia has virtually no state. Uh, the people of Denmark has quite a lot of state. Uh, it seems, it seems kind of counterintuitive to what you're promoting, that, that the most regulated and taxed people in the world should be, coincidentally, the, the happiest people in the world. Too. Great question. Great question. Uh, in spite of the insult, uh, nothing I said excludes compassion. The idea that people who are self-interested are not compassionate people is something you just made up to devise a, a straw man that was never mentioned and doesn't even exist. So, the, you know, I talked a lot about love. Love involves compassion. There's lots of things that involve compassion. Compassion is a value, one of many values. Compassion does not require sacrifice. Indeed, most people who sacrifice, like Mother Teresa, feel no compassion. Feel no compassion. It's people who are capitalists who feel the most compassion. But let me answer your question about happiness of the Danes, because it's kind of funny. Uh, so first, nobody in his right mind, well, some people, but they're not in their right minds, nobody in his right mind uses Somalia as an example of anything good in the world. And certainly, my example didn't say, oh, if there was only no government, everything would be great. I'm a great believer in government. I'm not an anarchist. I never use Somalia as an example of anything good, anything. Uh, I believe in government that does a few things and does them really well. It does the protection, the definition of protection of property rights, it does policing, and it does military. Three things that don't exist in Somalia. When those three, three things are done well, you get happy societies, like Denmark, we'll get to the welfare part of that in a minute, like Hong Kong, which has no welfare state, but people are pretty happy, other than with the lack of, with the lack of democracy. <laughs> Okay, it's a piece yeah. missing, but, but this is the funny thing about Hong Kong. 70 years ago, 70 years ago, Hong Kong was a fishing village in which about 30 to 50,000 people lived. Today, Hong Kong has 7.5 million people. Those people weren't born in Hong Kong, right? They came from all over Asia. They risked their lives to come to Hong Kong. They swam, they went on rafts, they went on little boats from all over Asia to come to Hong Kong. Why? Hong Kong had no safety net. Because they had opportunities, because they had protection for property rights, and they could make something of their lives. Now they've reached a point where they want to vote too. Good for them, and I support that completely. But just property rights without a vote drew 7 million people into Hong Kong. 7 million people. They never had to vote. Under the British, they still didn't have the vote. They were ruled by a governor. And yet, they still flock to Hong Kong. So it's the property rights that drew them there. Now, it's funny about Scandinavians. Scandinavians are happy people. When you go around asking Scandinavians if they're happy, they all say, yes, we're very happy. It's funny because if you ask Scandinavians in America if they're happy, they say they're even happier than Scandinavians in Scandinavia. It's true. On the other hand, I'm, I'm from a Jewish origin. Right, I was born in Israel. If you ask Jews if they're happy, they never say yes. We don't, culturally, it's unacceptable. You say no, who are complaining? I mean, the studies that measure happiness are so bogus and so funny and so distorted. I mean, really. Now, even on the level of economic freedom, 
Denmark, uh, you know, they, uh, these organizations put out um, uh, economic freedom indexes, which countries are the most economically free and which are less economically free. Denmark scores very high. The United States is well below Denmark. The United States is less economically free than Denmark. So it's true Denmark has high taxes, but it doesn't only have high taxes. It has strong rule of law, strong protection of property rights, low regulations. Danish businesses and banks are far less regulated than American ones. And generally, it's more economically free than America. So it's very murky in this world of lots of mixed economies that measure relative economic freedom and relative happiness, particularly when you take into account when you can control when you don't control for the million other variables that are going on, like culture and, and expect social expectations and all these other things. Uh, the example of Somalia is good. Nobody's happy in Somalia. Nobody should be happy in Somalia. Somalia is a disaster by all of our standards. We can agree on that, at least. Next question. Yes. Um, my question would be, do you not see a problem in the credibility of the comments, or do you not believe in that? No, so I, I, I think there is a tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy is that we have commons. Commons are dirty. Commons are not treated well. You saw that when the wall came down 25 years ago between East Berlin and West Berlin. The commons in communism were filthy. It was the most polluted place on the planet. Far more polluted than Western Europe was. I mean, that was the first thing that struck visitors when they crossed over to Eastern Europe, is how filthy everything was, how polluted everything was. And the reason was, it was the commons. There was no private property. The solution to the commons is not to have any, which means private property, which means, I know, which means you privatize. Yeah, but, but what is the environment? Put aside global warming for a second. What is the environment other than global warming? Global warming aside from it. I'll talk about global warming. I'm not trying to evade the question. I just want to separate it out into units so we can discuss it intelligently, which is unusual, I know. But what is an environmental example? Fish stocks. Well, the best way to deal with fish stocks as people have already started experimenting in Iceland and in Norway, pretty, pretty, collect, pretty social estates, is by privatizing them. By, by, yes, by creating uh, private units to measure how much you take and, and you own it. And you can trade these units yeah. and it's actually solved the fish stock problems. And there are other ways in which you can privatize the fish in the oceans to protect those fish stocks. You know, I'll give you another example. Fishes, elephants. Elephants are becoming extinct in Africa. And then they found a solution. You know what the solution is? Private elephants. Private, no. Well, you won't let me answer, right? So you create private reserves in which the owners have an incentive to protect their elephants from poachers because they make money at it, either through visitors or through organized hunts. But if you hunt an animal and there's profit in it, there's more of that animal to be had. What? Carbon trading schemes. Carbon no. trading. So what's that? Carbon trading. Carbon trading. Yes. So you're asking about global warming. Yes. When there's a problem. On the market. The question is. Would I be in favor of carbon trading? Because didn't I say fish stocks are a form of carbon trading, right? Because you've got a fish stock, you, you, get, a, you get a piece of the, of the action, if you will, and then you can trade it and develop it. Wouldn't I apply that to carbon trading? If I believed carbon was a problem, if I thought the solution was to reduce consumption of carbon, even if it was a problem, if I thought the reduction of carbon was the solution, then carbon trading is the right approach to have. If, if, if. I don't necessarily think it's about not a scientist. I'm not going to make a definitive statement about it, but neither are you guys, but you guys have been brainwashed into this. 98% of scientists? 98% of scientists don't believe that. So it's another feature of your brainwashing is you believe that 98% of scientists believe this. 
Every study shows the 98% of scientists do not believe this. But. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> That's a nice, nice, nice use of math. <laughs> Let me finish. You can disagree with me. You're going to disagree with me. That's fine. Let me finish. For decades, for decades, the environmentalist movement has been feeding us one catastrophic scenario after another. I'm a finance guy. I'm a finance guy. You come to me and you want me to invest. I ask you what your track record is. And if you tell me that every investment you've ever made, you've lost money, I don't invest in you. So I look at the environmentalist movement. I'm not a scientist. I don't know the, the numbers, right? right? I look at the environmentalist movement, and I study it going back. And I look at what they say about DDT, which scientists 20 years later said was untrue. I look at what they say about global cooling. Remember, you guys don't remember global cooling, but some of us do because we're old enough. In the early 70s, the Earth was going to cool front page of the New York Times, all the scientific magazines, 98% of the scientists believe the globe was going to cool. Didn't. 1968, the famous book came out by Paul Ehrlich, one of the great, great environmentalists that people still worship to this day, that said that hundreds of millions of people were going to die of starvation during the 70s because of overpopulation. Didn't happen. So when I look at these things, these string of failures, I am skeptical. I'm skeptical of what they tell me next about the end of the world. The end of the world ain't happening. Is it possible that you're only keeping out some failures? No, I'd love to hear about the successes. But <laughs> love to, sometimes. I'm going to have a catastrophic losses. Okay. Let me keep going. Now, let's say, let's say that they're right. Let's say the globe is warming. Let's say it's all true. I'll grant you it all. I'll grant you that carbon, that human, the human beings are causing the warming that stopped 14 years ago for some bizarre reason, but 16 years ago. But let's say it still happened, right? What's the solution? Now, I, I can guarantee you one thing, that the solution cannot be, should not be, must not be, stop using carbon fuels. Because what that actually means is stop living. Because it does. You can laugh. But everything, you can, everything around you is made of carbon, fuel, of oil, of natural gas, the plastic of the chairs you're sitting on, this bottle, this cup. Most of the, most of the synthetics in your clothes are made from carbon. Most of the stuff in this room is made from oil byproducts. Stop using oil. Stop refining oil. Yeah, might as well go back. 300 years ago when we were all poor, we were all starving, we were all subsistence farming, children died before the age of 10, life sucked. Carbon emissions are created while you refine the oil to create the plastic. Where do you think carbon emissions come from? The whole process is about carbon emissions. You know when you stop emitting carbon? This is where, this is where people, you lose people. You stop emitting carbon when you're dead. Only time when, you, when your footprint is zero. And I guess some people like that. They want us to have a zero footprint. Yes? Um, yes, I was wondering how you defined coercion. Because in the last part of your lecture, you were more or less... Uh, you implied that uh, governments have a monopoly on coercion, since they can actually enforce law on people. But in my opinion, I think that money is one important uh, so there's, there's an important distinction, in my view, between two types of force, or, or two types of power, put it that way, two types of power, political power and economic power. Political power is about guns. It's about grabbing you and moving you somewhere you don't want to go. Economic power is about providing you with values voluntarily. You do not have to buy an Apple product. You do not have to buy a phone. You do not have to use carbon fuels. You can go live in the woods. You have, it's your choice to participate or not participate, to trade or not to trade. That is very different. And that is not coercion. Money is not coercion. The only way I can get your money 
is by offering you something that you value more than your money. When somebody sells you bread for $2, you value the bread for more than $2, so you're willing to trade for it. Nobody coerced you. You chose to use that $2 to buy the bread. When I offer you an iPhone, nobody coerces you to buy it. You give me your money voluntarily because you want something more valuable to you than that money. So money is not coercive. Money is voluntary, and if you're smart about it, money buys you an improved quality of life, an improved living standard, and that's always the case. Um, I just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so you've, um, you say that money is a good thing, and my question is about if, um, I mean, if the individual is always striving to get more money into their bank account and economically be more stable, I think that the, the capitalist system itself, the competition is an inherent aspect of that, and, you know, that, that kind of supports the selfishness and you know, striving for your own personal development. But isn't there with competition a race to the bottom? And with that, don't you think a race to the bottom kind of eliminates a lot of people? And you say that everyone can kind of achieve this economical stability and, you know, be in there. But yeah. don't you think it's more, if you're born or developed in the right uterus, then you'll, you'll be good economically. But otherwise, I don't think university, we're all going to be economically okay. good. I mean, okay. I think that is... So... Let me, let me deal with two aspects of what you're asking. One, uh, 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 competition is a race to the bottom. That's bizarre, because in every, in every really competitive market, where we leave the market free, what happens to the goods that, we, that are produced? Do they get, is it a race to the bottom, or a race to the top? What happens to those goods? They get better. And do they get cheaper or more expensive? They get cheaper. So it seems to me that it's a race, I'll get, I'll get to that part of your question. It's a race upwards. It's a race to constant improvement and rising standard of living. Because as the goods get cheaper and better, more people can afford them, more people's lives are better off. Well, this, by the way, is true of labor markets. No, no, but what about all the incentives of like planned obsolescence? Isn't that... That's like not what? Product, planned obsolescence? Yeah. Isn't that, that's not product... No, but that's, the planned obsolescence is a, is a fantasy. <laughs> it's a fantasy. So the question is, what about planned obsolescence? Isn't that a drive to the bottom? But that's a fantasy. How long does one of these last? How long does one of these last? Anybody have, anybody have an iPhone 3? Anybody have an original iPhone? It still works. Nobody planned its obsolescence. It still works. The only reason you're not using it is because you don't want to. You still want something faster and cooler and cheaper and better. Yeah, but you could use the old software. Nobody is preventing you from using the old software. Nobody's preventing you from using the old... Uh, the, I mean, you're thinking of virtue, that people are improving their software and improving computers and turning it into a vice, which is bizarre. Okay. Plan obsolescence doesn't exist. Well, then there was a case... It doesn't. Now, if it did exist, if it did exist, some smart capitalist would say, hey, guys, my product lasts longer than all of your products, and I'll sell it a little cheaper. And we would, if we didn't want the plan obsolescence, we'd all buy the longer lasting product and he'd get the entire market share and drive everybody else out of business. That's how markets work. That is really how competitive markets work, not how your fantasy world that your professors teach you works. Competition drives upward. Now, take capitalism. Everybody's going to be getting poorer and poorer and poorer if what you're saying is true. But why is it that the exact opposite happens? Before we had capitalism, before you had capitalism 250 years ago, how many people were poor? What percentage of the human population lived in poverty before capitalism? 99%. Almost everybody was poor. By the standard of poverty 200 years ago, how many people today in the West are poor? Nobody. <laughs> By the standards of 200 years ago, nobody today is a subsistence farmer starving because of the wealth produced by capitalism and redistributed by socialism. And it had to be produced first. 
had to be produced. Just look at the numbers. All those people who came to Hong Kong were good, poor. You know how rich people are in Hong Kong today? Average wealth in Hong Kong is equal to that in the United States. And yet they were all good, poor when they came in. Today they're rich. Why? Because they produced, because they created, because of competition. Competition drives wealth up, drives standard of living up, drives quality up and costs down. In every single market it's tried. And when the reverse happens, it's always because of government regulations, government price controls, government intervention. Now, where's the next question? I, I, I'm just following the mic. Hi, uh, yes, we have talked about the welfare state, yes. Uh, welfare state, yes. So what do you think is supposed to happen to people who just don't make it? You know, who don't make it for various reasons, doesn't really matter why. Uh, are they supposed to die? Or are you then like, for the welfare state also in relation to crime? Maybe? So first, first, the percentage of people who can't make it is insignificant. It's tiny. I know you laugh because you've never lived in the world. Capitalism creates more jobs than there are jobs to fill. When immigrants came to America in the 19th century with no safety net, no redistribution of wealth, nothing, or to Hong Kong, those seven millions who came to the island, they all got jobs. They all took care of themselves. They all found their lives getting better. None of them went to school. I mean, my ancestors, poor Jews, came from the middle of Poland, they were ignorant, they were poor, they were unskilled, and they came to the shores of New York, and they got jobs, and they found a way to make a living, and they saved, and they sent their kids to school. But they rose up by their own effort. Now, there's always a small percentage, a tiny fraction of a percent, who really can't make it. Okay, so they're disabled. It's a tiny little fraction of a percent, right? I agree. What would happen to them? Well, they'd be, they'd get charity. Now, you laugh. But look, at the end of the day, somebody who can't make it only has two options in life. They can come and ask me for my help. And I'm a benevolent, nice guy. And if I've got extra money, and if I like the person, I'm likely to help them. Americans, for example, today, give $350 billion a year in charity, in spite of all the taxes. It's a lot of money, even in America. Or they can come to me and pull out a gun and steal my money. That's the only two options. All we do in democracy is pretend that it's not theft, because we voted on it. Somehow we turn theft into taxes by voting and consider it moral. But theft is theft. So if somebody really can't, he's dependent on other people. And in my view, he's dependent on other people's goodwill. And if we all believe that these people should be helped, because I think it's legitimate to want to help them. They're human beings after all. We do feel compassion after all. Then we can all get organized and form a charity and give them money. But if this guy over here doesn't want to help them, you know, because he's struggling or because he's got no kids to help, or for whatever reason he doesn't feel like it today, he doesn't have to participate. It's his right. We don't have the right to force him to help them. But if we all want to help, we can all help. You want to help. I want to help. He wants to help. We'll get together, form a charity, and give them money. That's not hard. And it's not a lot of money because there are not a lot of people who are so handicapped, who are so in incapable of taking care of themselves. 99 plus percent of the population can work, work well enough to take care of themselves and live in a higher standard of living, in my view, under capitalism than any welfare state could provide them. Because I know what, under real capitalism, you get all this innovation, all this creativity, all this wealth creation. You don't just get an iPhone, but you get this kind of innovation, this kind of motivation, this kind of energy into every field of human endeavor. And imagine what would happen then. Right now, it just goes into technology. Why does it only go into technology? Because it's the only area we don't regulate. The one place where the government doesn't interfere, it doesn't control, it doesn't tell us what to do and how to do it, is this. So this is where the innovation happens. If you want innovation in healthcare, privatize it. You want innovation in, uh, I don't know, airplanes? Get rid of the government regulations that are constraining the regulation. Last innovation in airplanes was the Concorde, and we've grounded that and killed that. Where's the rest? Uh, next question. Where's the microphone? 
Yeah, hello. Um, just coming back to the small percentage of people who do not make it. Um, earlier in the lecture, you said um, that earning money is a great thing, we should be very proud of it, and it's a very noble thing. Yeah. Um, so I would just like to hear your take on uh, those who cannot make it, given by the circumstances, not because they're lazy, but given by the yeah, circumstances. Yeah. Say Somalia. Yeah. Um, what is your take? Can they not be noble? Or I mean, you're obviously trying to be provocative, and you're enjoying it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean say, I'm not trying to be provocative. I am enjoying it. I just am provocative. It's not, I don't have to make a big effort to be provocative. I believe in everything that I say. Look, there's a difference between people... So let's take people in Somalia. I mean, I think it's a tragedy. I hope you won't think it's a tragedy what's happening in Somalia. I think it's sad because the people in Somalia don't have the freedom, don't have the physical protection to make the most of their own lives. It's, it's sad. I am horrified by the lives of people in Somalia. It's... It's tragic. Can they be noble and good? They can try, yes, and some of them are. Some of them are. But their circumstances are such that external forces are destroying their lives. Can you be, are you good when somebody's pointing a gun at you and you're running around the desert trying to stay alive? You don't have time for goodness. You just are. But that's sad. That's not the way human beings should live. So my is not an example of anything. Now, I believe that Again, almost every human being, 99 plus percent of the planet, is capable of being, taking care of themselves and therefore being noble and good and everything else, including people in Somalia, if they had freedom, if they had property rights, if they had the physical space protected. The reason they are suffering is not because they're not altruistic enough. The reason they're suffering is not because, it's because there's chaos, there's anarchy in Somalia. And that's a tragedy. But let me say, I, I find it fascinating. It just proved to me on how well indoctrinated you are. That there's not been a single question, not a single question, on what it actually means to live a good life. And what it would, what it would take to be happy. What it would mean to be a flourishing human being. All your questions about how do I help that person over there? What about that person over there? What about him? We live in such a dominantly Selfless, such a this morality is so ingrained in all of you. You can't even think about what's good for me. How do I live well? What's how, how do I attain happiness? That should be what really should be on your mind. Not what happens to one percent over there. Mostly they can take care of themselves. They don't need your help. It's pretty arrogant of you to all think that you can help those people. That you know how other people should live, how other people should be happy, what values they should pursue. That's typical. Western middle class, right? We know, and we're comfortable. And we sit in nice chairs while we're contemplating the fate of Somalis, right? Go to Somalia, see what it's like. But you should be focused on your own lives. Yeah. She has a question about her own life and her own happiness. So give her the money. Here, yeah. <laughs> After him. Oh, all right. Um, so. You said you, are, you refer to Steve Jobs a lot, and um, certainly he was very innovative, but he wasn't that innovative about workers' conditions in the factories where his iPhones are produced. So um, the questions I want to ask is um, regarding liberty and freedom. Um, certainly liberty and freedom is also a question about the choices you have for yourself. And the workers in China certainly don't have the choice, have the choice between working 80 hours for Apple or dying. Is that freedom? And so, then, so and then to just the thing you said, just to take up your criticism. Sure. Um, so my question is essentially, with every political thing, is what is your utopia, right? What's the world we want to live in? And I think the system you're advocating, laissez-faire capitalism, it's happened, right, in the 19th century, and that was essentially the situation where people don't had a choice, didn't have a, cho have a choice between working and dying, and. You know, I think that's not the world we want to live in, and it's certainly not the world I want to live in. That's right. Before the 19th century, the only choice they had was to die. And you want to take the choice to live from them. And, and that's fantastic, right? You'd prefer dead people than people who have a choice between death and life. I find that bizarre. Because before 
Before the Industrial Revolution, before the Industrial Revolution, how many kids lived to see the age of 10? Less than 50%. What was life expectancy? 39. I can get to his question, believe me, I'll answer it in detail. Yes, I'm offering them a choice to live. That's exactly what the Industrial Revolution did. It raised the standard of living of all of us. You wouldn't be here if not for laissez-faire capitalism during the 19th century. You wouldn't have any wealth to redistribute today. We'd still be living to 39. We'd still be dying when we were children. You think, 19, you think the Industrial Revolution created child labor? What did children do before the Industrial Revolution? They worked on farms and died working on farms. What the Industrial Revolution allowed them to do is earn enough money so they didn't have to die. Oh, oh my God, what a horrible thing. Children living. We wouldn't want that, right? So what the 19th century did was allow us to create enough wealth so we as parents could take our children out of the workforce because nobody wants children to work and put them into schools. But before the end of the 19th century, before laissez-faire capitalism, before we created the wealth that laissez-faire capitalism allowed us to create, we were too poor to keep our children home. You guys should study just a little bit of history. It would be helpful. <laughs> but let me talk about China, because I, counter to you guys, have been to China, have talked to those people. They love their jobs at Apple. He loves their jobs at Apple because the alternative is not death. The alternative is not death. The alternative is going back to the farm and living under socialism, the system that you love so much. And that system, that system, well it is, because those are the two alternatives at the end of the day. And that system is horrific. That system is horrible. Now you say, why don't they just get European style salaries? Why don't we just pay Chinese workers what we pay Europeans? Well, because China doesn't have that kind of money. It doesn't have that wealth. They're not that productive. Where's the money going to come? You, you guys think the money grows on trees, or the government just prints it, of course. And it just is there, right? You have to make stuff to get money. China, over the last 30 years, China, through this horrible stuff that you described, has allowed more people to rise out of poverty than any country in human history during, the, during a 30-year period. Over 400 million people have gone from poverty into middle class in China. We should be celebrating this. We should be demonstrating in the streets in favor of more of this. More freedom, more capitalism, so more people can rise from poverty into middle class. Before capitalism, we were all poor. Suddenly, after the 19th century, we're middle class and rich. I wonder what happened in between. Welcome, China. China today. Go to China. Go to rural China, where there's no capitalism, where the party is still imposing its socialism. And go to Shanghai. Go to Shenzhen. Go to Guangzhou. Go to the cities in which they've allowed economic freedom and see the wealth that they have created. See the wealth that Chinese people have created for themselves. And you want to criticize these people for the lives that they have made? Because again, you sit in middle class Europe, twiddling your thumbs in a welfare state that survives because you've got some people producing and you can steal their money and give it to others. And you've got ancestors who created massive amounts of wealth because they were free. And you sit here and you judge Chinese laborers who are choosing a much better life, learning a skill, advancing in their profession. Some of them become plant managers and ultimately entrepreneurs and build their own businesses and become rich. It's a disgrace. I mean, literally, it makes me so angry. Because it is a disgrace. The West is a disgrace. Because you want to keep them in poverty. Let me go back to the CO2. Do you know, do you know what would happen to the poor in Africa if you guys got your way with CO2? You would institutionalize them into poverty. They would always be poor. Because the way to rise up is to burn fuel. That's how we get energy. So if you ban oil, Africans will always be poor, but you don't care. You care more about the snails than you do about anybody living in Africa. If you cared about Africans, you would be adequate for capitalism. You would want them to burn carbon fuels. You would want them to be rich. And the only way to be rich, the only way to be rich, 
is to make it, produce it, create it, and that requires economic freedom, that requires burning fossil fuel, that requires property rights. That's what you should be advocating for Africa, if you really care. You don't, you don't have compassion. I have compassion. I care about Africa. I beat Africa. I beat China. You laugh. Laugh what you want. I care about them. And, and because I care about them, I'm an advocate for capitalism. I'm not an advocate for capitalism because I want to be controversial, because I think it's funny, or I think it's cool, like you guys. I advocate for capitalism because I care about human beings and human life. I want to see us live to be 120. I want to see Africa thrive. I want to see them unbelievably productive. Because you know what? If Africa's productive, I'm better off. I understand that production is win-win. That if somebody else is rich, I'm even richer. I want everybody to be rich if they can. But for that, you need freedom, you need property rights, you need to produce, you need capitalism. So I'll give, you an, I'll give you an example. In the Fountainhead, yeah. Howard Walker, he's an architect. And he's about to get this, he's a poor architect. He has nothing, he's struggling, nobody wants to build his buildings. And then this, this, uh, this bank wants to hire him to build this amazing building and give him a lot of money for it. And he's all excited because his designs are there and they say, yes, you got the commission. However, Mr. Rourke, we want to make changes to your design. And, and he has a whole theory of architecture, agree or disagree. It's his theory. He believes in it. It's a modernistic theory, and they want to start putting Greek elements into his modern building. Right? He says, no. And they say, but you're going to give up millions of dollars. You're going to be rich. He says, it doesn't matter. My integrity is more important to me than money. So you're absolutely right. And that's what I said before. It's not about money. It's about your values. It's about you know, living your life, choosing rational values, Believing in those values, producing to take care of yourself, which I walk, he goes to the quarry, he works in a quarry because, because nobody would hire him as an architect, right? It's about creating and building, having integrity, being honest. It's about, that's what, that's what being self-interested really is. Now it turns out that if you're like that, right, if you're judging your own, you don't want people stealing your money. And you don't want people telling you how to build buildings, right? How do work gets to decide how to build buildings? That's where the laissez-faire comes in, right? It's only laissez-faire, not in the money sense. Money's just one aspect of it. It's in the sense of freedom. I want to build what I want to build. And if I can find other people who are willing to risk their capital and maybe risk, you know, constructing the building with me, then why can't we do it? Why do we have to have some zoning czar divided by the government tell us what kind of buildings we can and cannot build? Or if I want to create and build a new company, start a company tomorrow, why can't I just start a company tomorrow? Why do I have to fill out 20,000 different forms and talk to 10 different bureaucrats and go through a whole thing? So it's about doing what is really you. And that requires laissez-faire. The philosophy is not about, she said, I mean, said, she was for laissez-faire capitalism because she was for self-interest. And she was self-interest because she was for reason. The reason led to self-interest, and self-interest led to laissez for capitalism. But that's just an outcome. It's not, it's, not the pro, it's not the purpose, and it's not the whole philosophy. The philosophy is, is living by your own standards. Yes. But then why do you think it's misunderstood in this quite obvious well, because, ways? Well, because, again, we're so ingrained with the idea of altruism, with the idea of a, a philosophy that says live for others, that it's hard for people even to know how to, how to live it. And, and all the questions, again, about what happens to this guy? And isn't this good exploitation? It's all what your professors are talking Because what's interesting, and I know it's your professors, what? Because every group I speak to asks exactly the same questions. There's no variability. And the funny thing is, I got exactly the same questions in China. 
the same questions because they're again they're absorbing our Western values and they're getting the same style of. But this is what our professors, our preachers, our mothers, this is what they teach us, and it's hard to break away from it. Instead of, my focus in life is on being happy, is on being successful, what that takes, and it's hard. I always tell audiences, the toughest thing you'll do in your life is be self-interested. It's not about whims. It's not about whatever I feel like. It's about sitting down and really thinking through, what are my values? What's important to me? You know, what do I care about? How do I live? What profession should I take? How do I pursue that profession effectively? Who do I love? Love isn't just random emotion. You got to think about it. Because otherwise you're going to screw up sometimes. Okay? So it's, yeah. So it's about hard work. Applying your mind to the problem of living. Which is not easy and it's not trivial. And, and you know, it's, it's hard for people to accept it. It's hard for people to accept that that's what's important in life. Because they'd be taught the opposite, right? Because it's what people care about. It's what people care about. They should. I mean, it should be. It should be the end result, not the beginning. And and look, the, the environment, the political environment, affects us all. So I, you know, I can't live my life to the fullest ability, the fullest happiness, because fifty percent of my money is taken away from me. Because the stuff I want to do, the government controls and regulates and tells me I can't do it. Tells me where to live, how to live, when to live. So I care about love's affair because it restricts my ability to live the best life that I can live. That's why I care about it. Again, I don't care about the material stuff. I mean, I care about that. That's what defined me was. Yeah. All right. So in your lecture, you mentioned the 2,000 years since Aristotle. Yeah. I'm like wondering how come in this 2,000 years that uh, the, the morality of uh, you know self-sacrifice is just winning. You know, it's all this time, it uh, keeps on winning. And does that like imply that people can't think? Yeah. And isn't that a bit of a contradiction with that people are able to That's a good you know, question. to think and take care of themselves? It's a good question. It would be sad if the response was yes. <laughs> it implies that people can't think. Now look, you know, so, they, so there's, a, there's a wonderful book called uh, From the Cave to the Light, uh, which, is, which describes Western civilization in terms of a struggle between two sets of ideas. The ideas of Plato versus the idea of Aristotle. Plato is the mystic, collectivist, selfless, live for the group. Uh, Aristotle is the freedom, reason, individualism, right? The purpose of morality is eudaimonia, you'll flourish. And the Platonists keep winning. And I think the, the main reason in the West for that is religion. I think what happened is that very early on, Religion caught on to this. Because how, how do you control people? What's the best way to control people? Fear. Well, fear is one, but it's not a very productive one. There's a better one. It's guilt. That is, I tell you this heaven. I tell you these are the things you're going to do. You can't do the things that I'm telling you to do. So you're not going to do them. So you're going to feel guilty about them. And you're not going to make it into heaven. And then you have to bribe me so you can get into heaven. It's a fantastic system that... Ayn Rand describes that Attila and the witch doctor got together. Attila is the brute, the dictator, and the witch doctor is the priest. They got together and they devised this, right? And you see it in every culture, every culture. You guys don't live for yourself. Live for each other, live for the group. And by the way, only I know what's good for the group. So you're going to have to listen to me. Oh, God knows what's good for the group. And you're going to listen. have to listen to the witch doctor. And religion dominates our lives, unfortunately. And certainly Christianity. Think about the symbol of Christianity. I know I'm not supposed to talk about religion. Talk about that. Um, think. Can I talk about religion? In Europe, I can. So think about the symbol of Christianity, and I think you want me to end. Is that the point? Well, uh, let me let me answer the question. And think about the symbol of Christianity. The symbol, of, whether it's secular or religious, it's right there. It's a man on a cross. Dying not for anything he did, but for our sins. The worst possible kind of death that you can imagine. That's the symbol. We all wear it across. We, we wear it, yeah, right? In bracelets. 
We have it in churches, but it's a sec- secular symbol. It's the ultimate sacrifice, and that's virtue. That's goodness. That's to be admired. No, that's horrible. Nobody should die for other people's sins. You sin, you should suffer for them. But that's the symbol we've created. And it's so embedded in our culture that once in a while we escape from it a little bit during the Enlightenment. Or Spinoza. Or some philosopher comes around and manages to pop his head out a little bit to get us going in a different direction. But the thrust of it is so dominant. It's so everywhere. Again, it's in religion and it's been secularized into our philosophies, into our politics, into our culture. It's everywhere, this notion that the purpose of morality is to suffer. What a horrible life that would be if that were true. The purpose of morality is to live and enjoy and be happy and be successful and thrive. That's not Jesus on the cross. But that's what's been dominant in the last 2,000 years. Even in secular Europe, where Christianity was secularized by thinkers, primarily German, during the 19th century. That's my answer. Disappointed that nobody seems to understand that man is neither an individual nor a grand scale uh, collective being. It's a tribal animal. Man is genetically programmed to be tribal and live in tribes of about 150 people. So, this is why we're ingrained with instinctive um, drive towards self sacrifice. And this is the reason why everybody sort of starts to react very emotionally when you um, turn. Uh, of leave the impression that Ayn Rand is a pure single individualist. I think um, that 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 is a big well uh, uh, um, a problem with with Ayn, Ayn Rand and, and, and the whole theory. But evolving from that is that you um, say that you hope for democracy and and in, in countries where there's not. In my experience. Uh, democracy always leads to uh, growing socialism. Yeah, no, I, 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 I did not mean to say that I'm for growing democracy. I believe in, in, in constitutional republicanism, in a limited democracy where individual rights are protected and where you can't vote to take people's stuff away from them. You can't vote to silence people like we do today in Europe. You, you, majorities don't have a right to inflict those kind of things on people. So, from a pragmatic point of view, you're preaching a revolution. Oh, of course. <laughs> I'm a revolutionary. I don't happen to think it has to be a military revolution. I'd like it to be a peaceful intellectual revolution. But yes, I'm a revolutionary. My book is called, if you haven't seen my book, it's called Free Market Revolution. And I'm a proud revolutionary. I, you can join me if you want. Uh, it's, it's a fun cause. It's a good cause to fight for. I disagree with your biological characteristics as a man. We don't have time to really get into that debate. I believe man is ultimately an individualist who benefits from the tribe. And the way he interacts with the tribe, I mentioned, is by trade. That's the optimal way. We have reason. So even if we do have certain instincts, we can override those instincts through our reason. We can reason ourselves out of those instincts. I change my emotions all the time because I reason differently. I used to love this. I don't love them anymore because they've shown themselves to be rotten, so I love this. We all experience changing emotions based on changing ideas, changing evaluations. Our emotions come from our evaluations. And I'm not saying there's no genetic, there is a genetic influence. But I think it's much smaller than most biologists want because they don't understand free will. And I think we have the reason capacity to overcome it. Biologists don't understand free will. Yes, and I assume you believe it through you, because otherwise why are we having this debate? Good Sir, I just have a small question. Uh, if someone gave you a gun with one shot, and you were with your daughter in the room, who would you kill, yourself, or just, just an extreme example, just to know, should you act selfishness or not? 
Well, it's a great example. I mean, it's a, it's a silly example in this sense, and I'll answer it. It's a silly example because um, <laughs> that's our life. Morality is about life. It's not about life boats. Life boat scenarios is a, is a distortion of ethics. It's how they teach. I know that's how they teach ethics today. But it's, 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 it's the whole point of it is to tell you that ethics is not relevant to your own life. Ethics is about how you choose your career. Ethics is about how you choose your friends and how you choose your loved ones. Ethics is about what you do after you walk out of here and how important you, how seriously you take your own life and your own mind and your own ability. That's what ethics is about. Now, if you present it with an alternative, and I can think of more realistic alternatives. Somebody gave me a gun with one bullet. My child is drowning in a river. <laughs> and to save it, I'm going to drown. But would I jump in and save the child? Of course I would. It's my child. If it was your child and I was passing by, I might not. <laughs> because I'm selfish. It's my child. My highest value is the people I love. I don't want to live in a world where I didn't try to save my kid. I'd rather die. I think suicide is completely selfish under certain circumstances. Given how high the value of my child is to me, I would save them. Right? Take the bullet, if you will. But I wouldn't do it for your child necessarily. I, you know, I wouldn't. Uh, it's not mine. Okay, I'd like to come back to um, those that cannot make it in the ideal world of yours. However you say they're safe by us because it makes us happy to save them. But you also say they're only taught selfishness as the ideal, as the one value we only have left. So it wouldn't make me happy anymore to save anyone, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a great last question because this just proves my entire thesis. It's great. All you care about, I mean, this is, this again, <laughs> what you should care about is your life, your happiness. Uh, why would a selfish person ever help another person? That's the question. You know, if I see in my backyard, if I see a plant that's about to die, I'm going to water it. You know why? Because I love life. I love life. The philosophy of self-interest is a philosophy of love. It's about loving life, your life primarily, but life generally. We love animals, we love cats, we love dogs, we love all kinds of things. When you see a dying animal on the side of the street, you try to help it. You don't want to see stuff dying because you're a human being who loves. That's why I help this person. Not because it'll make me happy, it wouldn't make me happy. But it would be a positive, a little bit of positive in my life. It doesn't make me moral. What I do for myself is what makes me moral. But it doesn't, it's not hurting me either. And yet it fulfills my love of human beings, of the fact that they're alive. Now, if it was a bad human being, if I knew they were a nasty person, I wouldn't help them. I would let them rot. But if I don't know them, I'm benevolent. I'd assume better of them. And if I did know them, they were good. It wouldn't be part of my life. So... This is the, the, the whole notion of self-interest being cold, unpassionate, unloving, uncaring, no compassion, is a straw man. It doesn't exist. Really selfish people, people who really care about their lives, value their life so much, recognize the value of life so much, that they love all life to some extent, and are willing to share with other people, but voluntarily. And out of real compassion, not forced compassion, not fake compassion, not guilt-driven compassion. Would everybody be saved? I don't know. But I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about living. You should be worried about living and making the best of your life. And that problem is such a marginal problem. The whole problem of those people who can't is such a marginal problem. It's so insignificant. And not only that, the amount of wealth we create I mean, the amount of wealth we create in this mixed economy shambles that we have, that we call the West today, with economic growth of 0 to 1%, is pathetic. If we had free economy, we'd be making so much wealth that the little bit to help people would be nothing. Nothing. We're poor. We're dirt poor as compared to that parallel universe over here that doesn't have a welfare state. 